It's now only a few weeks until we reach that much-touted Bitcoin halving. On or about the 12th of May, we're going to see a reduction in the block reward from 12.5 Bitcoin to 6.25. Of course, there are so many predictions as to what could happen. From stock to flow models and talk of new Bitcoin moons rising, there is no shortage of theories. However, during this excitement, we have had two separate halvings, those of Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV. So what exactly happened, and can we make any predictions about the Bitcoin halving from these events? My name is Guy, and in this video, I'll be answering just that. And if you watch till the very end, then you will get my personal insight on where I see Bitcoin going post-halving. Before I roll into the vid, two things. Firstly, while I may have one or two qualifications, financial advisor sure ain't one of them. Didn't take that test, sorry. So, please treat everything in this video as purely an educational resource. Secondly, if this is the first time we meet, a very warm welcome indeed. If you want to get all these insights straight to your inbox, I highly suggest hitting up that subscribe button and pinging that bell. You won't regret it. Okay, that's enough of my nattering. Let's dive right in. Now, before I can cover a piece on the halving, I need to quickly explain what it is. If you're already a Bitcoin guru, then feel free to jump ahead with the timestamps that I've provided below. In a nutshell, the halving is a protocol-defined adjustment that will see block rewards cut in half. Block rewards are the Bitcoin awarded to miners for verifying transactions and propagating blocks. These are new Bitcoin that are minted and then added to the outstanding supply. As the block rewards halve, so do the ongoing supply being added to the Bitcoin network. The mining reward halves every few years and will continue to halve going into the future. Eventually, there will come a time when the mining reward will drop to zero and there will be no new Bitcoin created. This will be at the 21 million supply limit that most of you will no doubt know about. For the maths whizzes amongst you, this means that the Bitcoin supply graph is logistic and the supply growth goes through an exponentially decreasing halving factor. So, why is this event looked at so keenly? Well, for two factors really. What it does to supply and how it impacts the miners. As we can see, there will be a decreasing supply of Bitcoin. Well, not really decreasing. What we really have is a decreasing rate of new Bitcoin hitting the market. If demand is just kept constant, it means that there are more buyers looking for Bitcoin than is going around. And from Economics 101, what happens to price when you have an increased demand chasing a limited supply? That's right, increasing prices. This is part of the driving dynamics behind the stock and flow model. The stock of Bitcoin and the flow of new Bitcoin hitting the market. Then, the second impact on the miners is how it reduces their revenue and hence their profitability. If you're only getting half of the revenue with constant costs, so too will your profit drop. It's what miners do in response to the halving that is quite interesting, or deadly. Anyways, I don't want to babble on too long about this. If you want a more comprehensive halving overview, then I have a separate video which you can watch right here. Okay, so now you have a rough idea of what the halving is, but why are the Bitcoin Cash and BSV halvings relevant in this context? Well, because they are inherently similar. Bitcoin Cash is a fork of Bitcoin and BSV is a fork of Bitcoin Cash. They use the same mining algorithms, SHA-256, Total supply is the same, and they have the same block reward changes as well. This is important as it means that those who mine Bitcoin can also mine Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV. So the miners will switch their mining power to wherever is possible. The halvings are also happening at roughly the same time in the same market conditions. We have seen the entire crypto space rocked by the coronavirus-inspired market crash. So there are a lot of similarities that one can draw, but there are a number of differences which I will discuss in a bit. Anyways, let's take a look at what happened in these halving events, shall we? 
First up is the Bitcoin Cash halving event. It took place on Wednesday the 8th of April at block height 630,000. In the immediate run-up to the event, there was a lot of buying interest in Bitcoin Cash as the price reached just below $280. No doubt some speculators were trying to stash these sats in anticipation of the drop in supply rate. However, immediately post-halving, something else happened. Those mining pools who saw their revenue drop by half decided to turn their hashing power away to more profitable coins to mine. Given that their ASIC machines were tuned to mine SHA-256 coins, they either switched to mining Bitcoin or Bitcoin SV. You can see the impact of the fall in hashing power over here. As you can see, the hash rate dropped from over 3.5 exahashes per second to below 1.5 post-halving. This meant that blocks were being propagated at a much slower rate. In fact, the block just after the halving took over two hours to emerge. This of course also means a slowdown in the rate of transactions. While the network can usually handle about 116 transactions per second, it fell to just 1.11 TPS after this halving. This rate kept on falling, and at the time of this video was around 0.46. Now, the risk of falling hash rates does not just mean slower transactions. It also impacts on the security of the network. Less hashing power securing said network means that a 51% attack becomes that much more feasible. Right after the halving, the cost to conduct a 51% attack on the Bitcoin Cash network dropped to just under $6,000 per hour, not an unfeasible amount for a well-resourced attacker. Following hash power, the price also started to fall and has been falling since, not really consistent with the notion of a decreasing supply. Of course, some may say that there are a number of other factors specific to Bitcoin Cash that was driving this reaction to the halving. So let's take a look at what happened to Bitcoin SV, shall we? The day after the Bitcoin Cash halving, BSV reached its block 630,000. Like Bitcoin Cash, there was a run up in the price of BSV prior to the halving, where it reached a high of $221. Now, just prior to the halving, the hash rate on Bitcoin SV was at three exahashes per second. However, just like Bitcoin Cash post halving, those miners turned their hashing power away after that. The day after the halving, this had fallen to less than one exahash per second. This then drove the cost of conducting a 51% attack to below that of Bitcoin Cash at only $4,000. Of course, less hashing power also had the impact of driving down the block propagation speed and hence the transactions per second. And just as Bitcoin Cash had seen a decline in price post halving, we experienced the same with Bitcoin SV. Indeed, both price declines would have been consistent with the theory of many in the crypto community that price follows hash power. Now, it's worth pointing out that hash power appears to have picked up a bit more since then. We've seen an increase in the cost of conducting the 51% attack as well as an increase in the transactions per second. This is mainly due to inbuilt difficulty adjustments. As hash power drops, so does difficulty, which is an incentive to bring on more miners. Bitcoin Cash block propagation has been seesawing between a block every hour to one every two minutes. Some have even said that large mining pools are gaming the custom difficulty adjustment. And hash rate is still far below where it was prior to the halving, and those prices continue their lackluster performance. So, quite the opposite of the rally that many had hoped for. It's also worth pointing out that a similar thing happened to Litecoin last year. There was a rally in the price prior to the halving, which quickly retraced post-halving. So, given that we have three different examples of halvings that were anticlimactic, can we infer anything to the upcoming Bitcoin halving? That is the 21 million Bitcoin question. Now, while one may want to draw parallels between these, there are a number of specific factors that could be different when it comes to the Bitcoin halving. Yes, the protocols are similar and the halving events will be happening at about the same time, but Bitcoin is still a much more popular cryptocurrency. Irrespective of where you stand on the battle of the Bitcoins, the original Bitcoin remains the most well-known and garners the most interest. Over the past few months, interest in the Bitcoin halving has eclipsed that of Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV. 
Just take a look at this halving tweet volume for Bitcoin versus the forks. And it's not just retail and media interest in the event. It remains in the portfolios of nearly every crypto-focused hedge fund or crypto whale. It's hashed by nearly every big mining pool and farm in the world. So, quite simply, there is a lot of money backing Bitcoin. Money and hash power. Take a look at this graph of the hashing power on Bitcoin versus on Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV. Over 110 exahashes per second are securing the network. It really is stark. Of course, when block rewards halve, it will no doubt have an impact on the profitability of mining Bitcoin and securing the network. There will be miners who cannot afford to hash anymore and will switch their mining machines off. However, I don't seem to think that the hash rate fall will be as precipitous as that of Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV. Some may think it's more profitable to mine Bitcoin Cash or BSV immediately post-halving, but the vast majority who can still afford to will continue to hash it out. What makes me say this, you ask? Well, just because it's been like that. Before any halvings, it was quite clear that the miners overwhelmingly chose to hash Bitcoin. Let's pull up that hash rate graph again. There have been many occasions where mining Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV was profitable, and sometimes more profitable than Bitcoin. Some may jump ship, most hold steady. Those who jump ship realize that they have pushed up the difficulty on the fork and then come back into the fold and get back to mining that digital gold. So this leads me to conclude that the fall in hash power is likely to be nowhere near as precipitous on a relative basis compared to the likes of Bitcoin SV and Bitcoin Cash. Now, having said all of that, I do think that we will see a hash power fall of some sort. Many of the marginal miners will not be able to keep up with the cost of production and they will switch off those machines. How big of a fall? Hard to say. However much it is, I don't think it's likely to be that sustained. Let's also not forget about those difficulty adjustments. Bitcoin's adjustment mechanisms are likely to be a lot more consistent than the seesawing we have seen with Bitcoin Cash. As the difficulty comes down, hash power could come back online and we could see a recovery of some sorts. There is of course precedent for this, given that we have a previous two halvings under our belt. Here is the graph of the hash power post the 2012 halving, and here it is post the 2016 halving. Slight dip post-2012 halving, but nothing to write home about. Miners were brought back to the table when the difficulty adjusted, and the upward march continued. Now, I know that most of you are interested in the price, and I hope I am not making a hash of this video. Get it? Hash of this video? Sorry, just had to throw that one in there. But understanding the hash power dynamic is important to determine the factors at play post-halving. On to the price though. If you subscribe to the hypothesis that price follows hash power, we could see a fall in the price of Bitcoin immediately after the halving. However, as hash power starts to return post-halving, the price could reverse itself. Then you also have to think about the supply and demand dynamics taking place. Many people tend to think that the halving means a drop in supply. Not correct, it means a drop in the rate of supply the flow of Bitcoin. Hence, there's unlikely to be a really noticeable shift in the amount of supply on the market. It will take some time before the slower rate of supply is being chased by a fixed demand growth. But why postulate? Let's pull up the price action post the previous two Bitcoin halvings mentioned above. Here you have the price of Bitcoin immediately after the 2012 halving. As you can see, Prices were pretty range-bound for at least two months before they started really picking up two months after that in early 2013. Then, taking a look at prices post the 2016 halving, it even falls for most of the month of July. However, in the middle of August, the trend is reversed and prices start their rally. This was, of course, the start of the 2017 rally, a rally that I'm sure you all know about pretty damn well. So then, what do I think is likely to happen in this halving? Well, I think a lot of the price action post-halving will be driven by what happens in the next few weeks prior to it. I want to give a quick shout out to the sponsors of this video, Paxful. 
Paxful is one of the easiest and coolest ways I've found to buy or sell Bitcoin instantly. Paxful is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace with over 300 payment methods. This includes some truly crazy options like gift cards for World of Warcraft and Amazon, to cash in the mail or even phone top-up cards. Over 100 e-wallets are also supported, including the likes of PayPal and WeChat Pay. To get started on Paxful today, go through to the link in the description. Then simply select the payment method you want, scroll through the marketplace, identify trusted Bitcoin sellers by looking at their reputation score, and select the deal you want. Finally, key in the amount of Bitcoin you want to buy, and you're done. So, if you've had trouble with limited payment methods on crypto exchanges, then you should definitely check out Paxful. After all, can 3 million users be wrong? Now, back to the magic. We all know that financial markets can sometimes be irrational. Investors will buy up an asset purely as a speculative bet that they can sell it in a few months at a higher price. If this were to happen in Bitcoin, we're likely to see an artificially inflated price. A price that does not really reflect actual demand and supply balances, but one that has seen a lot of hype buying. People will have bought Bitcoin as they expected the price to moon right after the halving. However, what happens if the event itself turns out to be a bit of a non-event? Prices don't rally the day after, and these speculators start to realize that. They then start selling, and if demand growth slows much quicker than the rate of supply, you have the perfect ingredients for a falling short-term price. However, as soon as the lower supply rate starts to work its way through the system, demand and supply imbalances should lead to an increase in price. Slower block propagation times could also impact on this. Hence, if we see a big run-up to the actual halving event, we're likely to see price action much more reminiscent of the 2016 halving. Short-term retracement that shakes out some weak speculative hands. Of course, there's also the possibility that prices remain range-bound prior to the halving. Participants in the market could take a wait-and-see approach leading up to the halving. Then, after the event, an increasing demand coupled with a decreasing supply growth will feed through to the price. If this event were to occur, we will see price action much like that of the 2012 halving. Now, this is a useful analysis, but I'm sure that many of you are aware of the disclaimer. Past performance cannot be a predictor of future returns. So, what could be different about this halving event then? Well, I'm sure the answer is quite obvious. None of the past two halvings took place at a time when the global economy was entering a deep recession, let alone a potential depression. They didn't happen at a time when trillions upon trillions of baseless fiat money was being thrown into the system. They didn't happen at a time when a global pandemic has caused many to question the basic efficacy of fractional reserve banking. For example, did you know that the Fed set the reserve ratio at banks to 0% recently? This basically means that banks have to hold zero cash deposits in reserve to lend out however much they want. Just let that sink in. Magic money that Jerome gave his pal Jamie authorization to print. So yes, this halving is happening in a global environment that really could see Bitcoin coming of age, at a time that Bitcoin supply will drop once more. Anyways, time to wrap up this video with a few of my final thoughts and views. Yes, the Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV halvings were a disappointment. Much like the Litecoin halving in late 2019, they didn't bring the moon that many were expecting. In the case of Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin SV, their similarity to Bitcoin also could have adversely affected them. Miners left the chains and turned their hashing power to the granddaddy of crypto. These hash power falls were not ideal for network efficiency and security. Yet, as I've shown, it's highly unlikely that we'll see any of these outcomes for the Bitcoin halving. Despite their protocol differences, they are inherently different in terms of retail demand, investor interest, and general adoption. I think that the actual halving event itself won't lead to a massive post-halving rally. It will take some time for the miners to come to terms with the new rewards and for difficulty adjustments to be made. However, when those supply and demand imbalances work their way through the system, 
prices are likely to adjust and we could see that post-halving rally most are hoping for. A rally that will no doubt be fueled by the current general economic uncertainty and helicopter money shenanigans. In a time of such unprecedented monetary madness, ain't it great to know that there are only ever going to be 21 million Bitcoin? That's it, my fellow crypto fans. That is my overview of the halving. But the most important thing is what you guys think. What do you think of the recent and upcoming halvings? Any price predictions post-halving? Hit me up in the comments. And if you guys like that content, then help me to help you. Smash up that like button and please don't forget to subscribe. There is a lot more just around the corner. Oh, one more thing before I leave you. I actually have something pretty important to share. Recently, I've started a weekly email newsletter. It was my way of succinctly crystallizing my views on the crypto market for the week ahead. Nowadays, I also share unique insights as well as juicy coin tips. Keen to be a part? Well, you better check out the description where I've linked to a sign-up form. All you need to do is enter your email address and hit submit. That's it. You're now locked, loaded and ready to receive my next email. See you guys soon.